Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you George Raff, Raymond Massey, and Julie Bishop in Action in the North Atlantic. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In the dim past of 1942, the wolf packs of German U-boats were sinking ships faster than we could build them. But the undersea killer was beaten. Beaten by old weapons and by new. By gun and bomb and depth charge. And by the iron hearts of the merchant seamen. From every part of America, they went down to the sea in ships. And there, many are buried in unmarked graves a thousand fathoms deep. Some came from Marblehead and were born to the smell of salt air. Some from Missouri. They'd never even seen the ocean. Hollywood produced a magnificent motion picture tribute to the men of the merchant ships. It's called Action in the North Atlantic, and we present it as our play tonight with George Raft, Raymond Massey, and Julie Bishop as the stars. Warner Brothers made the picture, and by the way, everyone at that studio is talking about a new comedy called uh, <coughs> Make Your Own Bed. Action in the North Atlantic is more than a drama of ships and submarines and sinkings because there was unselfish courage behind these men at home, the courage of wives and children and sweethearts. And to them, a grateful nation must give thanks. Americans have always liked to go to sea from before the time the Yankee Clipper was queen of the seven seas. There have been lots of changes since then, too. Ships powered by steam, the radio, airplanes, and even in such everyday comforts as soap. Once it was a long and tedious process of home manufacture to make soap. Now it's as simple as saying Lux Flakes. I was reading the other evening how the first lady of one household washed her silk stockings in 1762. To begin with, they were put through four sets of suds from a strong soap, and then ironed on the wrong side. How long the stockings survived is rather questionable. Naturally, she did it herself, even though she had many servants, because the stockings were very valuable and had to be imported from abroad. The lady's name, incidentally, was Martha Washington. I imagine Martha would be quite envious to see how simply and quickly the whole job is done in 1944 with Lux Flakes. And now there's romance and adventure waiting behind the Lux Radio Theater curtain as it rises on action in the North Atlantic, starring George Raft as Joe Rossi, Raymond Massey as Captain Jarvis, and Julie Bishop as Pearl. It's late at night, and through the dark and lonely stretches of the North Atlantic, an American tanker butts its way eastward. Completely blacked out, the vessel is a murky silhouette in the waste of sea and sky. In front of the wheelhouse, the first officer peers into patches of fog creeping up like curious ghosts around the ship. That you, mister? Yes, sir. They run into fog the last half hour, huh, Captain? Maybe it's got company, too. Submarine. See anything? No, sir. Black night. Ow. What's the matter? Oh, it's that tooth again. I got a mouthful of red-hot pickaxes. Whose fault is that? Why didn't you get it fixed while we were in port? When I'm in port, I want to see something better looking than a dentist. You deserve what you got. <laughs> Sure, punishment for my sins. Get a whiff of this stuff. Fog's going to shut in full before midnight. Parker. Yes, sir. Come here. How's he been? Parker? Well, he'll do. Merchant Marine Cadet. Ah. Reporting, sir. Think he can find the bosun? He's below with the rest of them, sir. Metro. Tell him to post a double lookout, four and a half. Aye, sir. Oh, excuse me, sir. Expecting trouble. Look, kid. You are the captain. I gave you an order. Oh, sorry, sir. Wait a minute. You're here to learn. Here's your first lesson. An old law of the sea. When you get an order, don't ask questions. Now get below. Aye, aye, sir. Oh, remember when you were that age, Skipper? Yes, mister, I remember. When I was Parker's age, I'd been twice round the horn in the square rigger. Oh, it's different nowadays. There's no time to train a crew. How else can you learn the sea? By wearing a fancy cadet uniform like him? By sticking your nose in a book? Oh, give the kid a chance. He'll catch on. You don't catch on to the sea, mister. 
I've beat across every ocean in the book for 30 years, and I still learn something new every day. Well, and the difference between you and me, Captain, is that you remember the grief and I remember the fun. Ow. Next time we're in port, you better see a dentist first. Yeah. I wonder, do they have lady dentists in Liverpool? Yes, we're bound for England, a pickup crew in a hold full of high-test gasoline. She's an old ship, dirty, frayed around the edges, but she's been my home, and I give her the best I got. She does the same for me. I'm lucky I got a first officer like Joe Rossi. Hard as nails, but he knows what this is all about. He's worried, too. The others, the men below, maybe it's just as well they don't think too hard. They do their jobs and leave the rest to us. To the ship, to me, and to Joe. What do you want, Parker? Order from the captain, sir. He wants a double lookout, post at four and a half. Okay, Junior, run along. Yes, sir. What's the matter, folks? Old man nervous? Four of you guys are hooked for the deck. I'll send somebody else. I owe the pot six bucks. Nice, sir. Uh, Tony. Yeah. Fergus. Yeah. Why not? Okay, guys, hit it. You too, Professor. Beat it. Yes, sir. That's some punk kid, huh, Boats? How does a Kansas hay shaker like that ever get to see? Ah, how does any of us, Abrams? We're all muscle bound between the ears. Now, what do you say a thing like that for? A rust pot full of high test gas. If a torpedo connects, we got one swell chance, ain't we? You got the wrong angle on it, Johnny. The way I see it, if your ship's number is up, the subs will get it. If it ain't, torpedoes can connect right where you're sitting and nothing will happen. I don't want no torpedo where I'm sitting. I'm sensitive. Ah. Listen, Pulaski, I was shipping out when your buttons was safety pins. I was on a tanker in the last war. So what makes you want to ship out again? Because for 20 years I had my own business. Got my own house, too, and a little dough put away. But I want to keep it all, see? And I figured this is the only way to do it. So we didn't ask for this war, but we got it anyway. And I say it's the guy that, like in the song, says, we did it before, we'll do it again. Well, you and the war, Abrams, we got nothing to worry about. You just think I no faith, Pulaski. But I got faith in God, President Roosevelt, and the Brooklyn Dodgers. In the order of their importance. How about you, Whitey? Me? Ah, I'm on here for the dough. We get a 100% bonus, and I figure that ain't seaweed. Boats? Well, boys, I'm here because this is the one place my wife can't catch up with me. <laughs> At least so far she ain't. Thinks she can cut alimony off of me like blubber off in a whale. Oh, my corn. Ah, you and your feet. Hey, fellas, how about some music, huh? I got very delicate feet. Can I help it? In the last war, my corns always hurt when there was a submarine around. Hey, that machine played nothing else. Stop beating your gums. I like it. I knew a dame that sung that. She had a baby face and a brain to match. <clears throat> home, home on the range. I taught it to her. Well, what did you do that for? Yeah, now maybe you'll play something else. Hey, what's he so hot about? I wish you could turn off a dame that easy. I said, what did you do that because for? Because I'm sick and tired of listening to this. We didn't have a chance. In less than six minutes, the fire reached the gasoline. All you can see are great yellow sheets of flame and smoke that hit you like shots from a cannon. Your ears are full of screaming men and the ship is being tortured and torn. You know half your crew's lost. You do what you can for the rest and then you abandon ship. One lifeboat is left. Only one. The men swing over the side. Some jump into the water, flaming with oil. And you stand there and watch, full of an awful hate and an awful helpless. Get out of that boat, mister, and pull away. I'm waiting for you. Some of my men are still aboard. Turn us back there. There's nothing you can do. Don't tell me what I can do, mister. Get over the side. Yes, sir. See, look, there's nothing in the book says you got to burn with your ship. You can't help those men. Maybe not, but I'm going to try. If I can get... Well, Captain, will you come down? Blown to bits. Blown to bits. All right, Rocky. I'm coming. Somehow, through the burning oil, we managed to pull away. Once we were clear of the flames, we shipped oars and watched. We didn't want to, but we couldn't help it. The shock and the horror held us, fascinated. And suddenly, not a hundred yards away from us, the ship of shape of doom rose out of the sea. The Nazi submarine was surfaced. It breached and quickly turned their guns towards us. 
We can see them plainly in the glare. One of the Nazis started taking pictures, and another shouted at us across the water. This is the captain! They want the captain! I started to answer, but Rossi grabbed me before I could open my mouth. There is the captain of that ship! We left him on deck! He's dead! If they killed enough of us as it is, is. They think they can scare us off the sea. They'll find out different. Excuse me, sir. Did we start rowing? Have you all got right life jackets, men? Yeah. All right, pull away, boys. Look, they're bearing down on us. They're going to ram us. They're going to ram us. Jump. Jump for your lives. Get in the water. Hurry. Keep clear of the diving bank. Swim as fast as you can. <laughs> Laugh, you apes. Savages. You had your blood and fire to make you laugh. But our time is coming. We'll pay you back. I swear to God, we'll hunt you, Tom. We'll hunt you down and slice you like a piece of cheese. They can't hear you, Captain. Oh, no. but God can. We spent 11 days on the life raft. There was no food, no water. Two more of my men died, and then we were rescued. The destroyer picked us up and brought us back home. When we stepped in the dock, there were a lot of reporters, even the newsreel. They asked questions, but there wasn't much to tell. What can you say? Well, what happened, Captain, when the torpedo hit your tanker? It caught fire. Exploded. What happened then? We abandoned ship. Did you see the submarine, Captain? We couldn't help seeing it. It rammed it. Then what? And we spent 11 days on a raft. Look, there's their first officer, Mr. Rossi. You might like to talk to him. Thanks. Oh, uh, Mr. Rossi? Yeah? Are you going to ship out again, Mr. Rossi? Well, if you live on land and your house burns down, you get another house. Out there, a ship is home. If it burns, we get another ship. That's how it is, ain't it, boys? Uh, Thank you. Any of you men like to say something? Ah, uh, there's nothing to say. Captain and Rossi, they told you everything. That afternoon, we said goodbye. The men drifting automatically to the hiring hall of the Seamen's Union. There, among their own kind, they could talk and pass the time. Hours, days, or weeks, as they saw fit. Till they made up their minds to go to sea again or find a job on land. Joe Rossi had a room in town, but he left me at the nearest cafe. I lived in the suburbs. We had a little house, Sarah and I. She was waiting for me on the front porch. Oh, Stephen. Hello, Sarah. It's been so long, so long. No, no. They told me two weeks ago the ship was lost. The Navy picked us up. She was a fine ship, Sarah. Oh, what about the men? Good many were lost. Oh, and you, you're all right. You have a terrible sunburn. It'll wear off. I'm fine. Fine. See, is that coffee I smell? Yes, it's all ready. Come on in. We'll sit down in the kitchen. I sure would enjoy some of your coffee. You've been all right, Sarah. Oh, oh sure. I guess I worried some, but... Why, that's a new suit, Stephen. <laughs> it doesn't fit so good. Well, uh, I think the coffee's ready. You know what I'm going to do? What? Take a bath. I could soak for a month. Oh, then soak, my darling. I'll go light the heater. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. That was wonderful. Best bath I had in my life. Now the bed's ready. You want to go to sleep, don't you? I'm so tired, Sarah. Well, you get in there and lie down. I'll go to the market while you're sleeping. Ah, this feels so good. Sleep well, my darling. Close your eyes. That's right. Sarah... I feel tears on your face. I know. I'm silly. I'm just crying because I'm so happy. I should be used to it after all these years. Listen, I've weathered a lot of storms. I've always come back to you. Yes, darling, yes. Sleep now. You sleep. I'll be back soon. Yes, sir. Say, when'd you get in? This morning. Yeah, it's well to see you, Joe. How about hoisting one in the house? What do you recommend for a toothache? Whiskey straight. Apple It'll cure you. Oh, so you got entertainment now. That singer. You know her, Joe? Not yet, but I'm going to. Well, look on this. Yeah, but I'm too far away. I'll just carry this toothache medicine down to the other end of the bar. You can see him plain as anything. Dozens of ships. They're sneaking them out every day now. I even know the names of some of them. Hey, Jack, uh, the lady singing. You mind? No, I don't mind. The Western Star sailed an hour ago. Loaded with troops. Hey, Jack, uh, how about you and me sitting down on the booth? Come on, 
have a drink, huh? Hey, sure. Hey, see you later. Yeah, yeah. 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 Listening to you, Jack, uh, maybe the news ain't reached you yet. There's a war on. Well, ain't that exactly what I've been saying? Those ships are carrying men straight for the front. I seen them. Oh, you saw them, huh? The ships. Yeah, sure, I saw them. Well, what do you know? Come here. I want to tell you something. Here, closer. I want to whisper this. Go ahead. Hey, Mike. Yes, yeah, sir? Look what's on the floor. I think maybe you had a little too much to drink, huh? Yeah, better put him in a cab. Hurt your hand, Joe? Never do. I'll have another drink. Okay. You don't waste much time between drinks, do you? I never waste time. Look, I saw you stop that guy. Well, I try to do it as neatly and quietly as I could. Well, why couldn't you do it outside? I make my living here. He should have had his teeth kicked in. Big hero. Well, what would you do if a guy was shooting his mouth off? Turn him in, so he couldn't go and talk someplace else. Well, that ain't direct enough for me. Do you want a drink? Thanks, but I don't drink with drinks. Then sing. Oh, command performance, huh? Yeah, I like your voice. From the way you were staring at me, that's not all you like about me. That's all I know about you so far. Hey, uh, Joe. <laughs> uh, say, I uh, guess maybe you two should know each other. Uh, Joe Rossi, uh, fellow Neil. Oh, glad to know you. Hey, uh... Don't you ever smile? Once in a while, if there's a reason for it. Well, maybe I can dream up a reason. Mind if I hang around? Suit yourself, Mr. Rossi. When do you not go up here? Sometime after you've left. Maybe I'm leaving right now. I guess you made things pretty clear. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I guess I'm just in the dump. Well, I was thinking maybe when you're through, we could go somewhere and have a few laughs. Well, is he okay, Mark? Yeah, Joe's okay. All right. We'll have a few laughs. I don't know, Jim. You better have that tooth fixed. Yeah, I think I will. Hmm? I think I will. One of these weeks. <laughs> Mr. DeMille presents Act Two of Action in the North Atlantic, starring George Raft, Raymond Massey, and Julie Bishop in just a moment. Oh, Mr. Kennedy, do you know what year this is? 1944, isn't it? <laughs> no, I mean it's leap year. Oh, yes, I forgot. After all, I'm already married. Have you any plans, Sally? Yes, sir. I've got my proposal all rehearsed. Well, well. Now, what kind of a man are you looking for? Well, that's hard to put into words. When I see him, I'll know him. <laughs> I guess that's all. And what will you tell him? Well, I'll admit I'm not an expert on cooking... And I don't think I'd take any prizes at sewing, but I'm very thrifty. Of course, you're a Lux girl. Yes. Why would I save on stockings alone? Is it really a lot, Sally? Plenty, Mr. Kennedy. Why, do you know stockings are one of the biggest items in any girl's budget? Then it's no wonder Lux is America's fam- favorite stocking care. Luxing certainly does make stockings last. Recently, for example, a very famous laboratory made hundreds of tests, and they found stockings washed with Lux flakes lasted twice as long. Stockings rubbed with a cake of soap or washed with a strong soap went into runs fast. Well, I'm not a scientist, Mr. Kennedy, but I do know I don't get nearly as many runs as some girls do. And another thing, stockings fit a lot better when you lux them every night. Here's a good rule for leap year or any other year. Don't risk cake soap rubbing or strong soap. I'll finish your rule in line. Stockings that leap into lux every night are sure to wear longer and sure to fit right. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Action in the North Atlantic, starring George Raft as Joe Rossi, Raymond Massey as Captain Jarvis, and Julie Bishop as Pearl. The days on shore went quickly by. They were starting to turn out those Liberty ships fast, and they needed captains. They spent a lot of time in town lining up a new berth. I tried to look up Joe Rossi, but I never could find him. It seems that new girl of his was keeping him pretty busy. Once in a while, I'd see the boys from the old ship still killing time in the hiring hall of the Seaman Union. One, a hundred men must have shipped out today already. That's only a spit in the ocean. It'll take thousands away. They're turning out them new ships. Four oilers wanted. Three ABs. Report to the desk. Come on, Pulaski. Let's sign and get it over with. I ain't no hurry. In fact, I ain't ever going to sign on again. Well, what are you hanging around here for if you ain't going to sign up? I'm paid up. I'm still a member of this union. Listen, the only uniform we got is the union button. But no guy's wearing one who ain't got what it takes. Oh, I ain't got no guts, huh? 
Well, look, it's different with you single guys. You ever got a worry in the world. But I'm married, see? I got a wife and a kid's coming next month. So all right, I'm nervous. Then pipe down. What do you mean, pipe down? The matter ain't it allowed no more. No more free speech. Come on, forget it. Let's play cards. No, I won't forget it. Don't it matter if I want to know if my kid's going to be a boy or a girl? Don't it count no more? The home? Well, I want to see my kid, see? And I want to be with my wife. Go on, make a law against her. Put me in the nut house for thinking things like that. Well, go on. Why don't you say something? I don't talk to guys like you. I beat their ears off. They are, folks. You, all your brains are in your fists. If that's the way you feel, Pulaski, you got a right to say so. I got a family, too. You think my wife feels good with me at sea and my boy in England in the Air Force? You got a kid in the Air Force? Yes, but why talk about such a common thing? The trouble with you, Pulaski, is you think America is just a place to eat and sleep in. You don't know what size your future's buttered on. Believe don't me. Don't waste your breath. Twelve well, ABs, four firemen, two carpenters, one boatman. Hey, come on, you guys. It's one of them new liberties, a big one and fast. I just got all adult. They want a boatswain, O'Hara. What do you say? Let's go. You coming, Whitey? Yeah, I'll go find Jinx. So long, Papa Pulaski. What do you mean, so long? I'm coming. Huh? So I changed my mind. Maybe I talk too much. Welcome home, Pulaski. Welcome home. Yes? I'm looking for Joe Rossi. What do you want to see him about? Who is it, baby? That's you, Joe. Steve. Well, how are you? Come on in. Joe. You look worse than you did in that riot. Maybe, but it's been a lot more fun. Honey, I, I want you to meet a good old friend of mine, Steve Jarvis. I got a new ship, Joe, and I signed you on as first, providing you can report in half an hour. Half hour, huh? You're not going to go, Joe. Baby, I, I told you it was going to be like this. It's an old story with Joe and me. Is it? I'm always getting him aboard ship when he's tangled up in something like this. Something like what? Oh, don't mind him, Pearl. Uh, the old man of the sea. Joe, where's your Money? Money? You had a lot of cash when you got paid off. Now, wait a minute. We're not getting out of here without his money. Come on, miss. Hand it over. He gave me his money, and we put it in the bank. We put it in the bank. How do you mean, we? Me and the wife, Steve. We got spliced yesterday. Joe! <laughs> you stood there letting me make a fool out of myself. I don't know what to say, Mrs. Rossi. Oh, it's all right. Joe, how did it happen? I don't know. Uh, better ask her. I guess there's, there's no reason that makes any sense. I guess we just like each other. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Kind of hard to believe, ain't it? Me, all hitched up with a missus. It's fine, Joe. It's fine. Oh, then you can understand why Joe can't go. Oh, I got to ship out, baby. And when I get back, I'll take you up to Niagara Falls. If I don't get tired of looking at the water by that time. Joe, please. Pearl, there's one thing you got to understand. You've seen what's been going on and what we've seen ain't nice. And now that it's our war, too, we can't just sit around holding hands. Be right with you, Skipper. I know how it is, Mrs. Rossi. My wife feels just the same as you do. Does she? I'd like to leave you her telephone number. She's had a lot of experience being a sailor's wife. Thank you. Here. I wish you'd call her. Maybe she'll tell you I'm not always as dumb as I was when I come in here. Now, why don't you get in there and help him pack? I think I'd better. Excuse me. Need some help, Joe? Well, you can find me some shirts. Pearl, oh, I've been saying goodbye to people all my life. This is the first time it really meant anything. That's why I married you, Joe. Huh? So you'd have somebody to say goodbye to and come back to. That's what you wanted, isn't it, Joe? Here. Shirt. Yeah, I guess that's what I wanted. Oh, uh, say, do you mind if I take this along, this picture? I don't look much like a sailor's wife. Oh, it's swell. I'm sorry that other fellow's in it, Joe. We got it taken once at Coney Island. Who's the guy? Nobody, Joe. I don't even remember his name. Oh, I'll just tear him off. Joe, when will you be back? I don't know. Where will you be? They don't tell us that either, honey. Just someplace on the ocean. Can't sail on land. No place I can write to. Sorry, baby. That's the way it is, though. Well, goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, kid. Thanks for everything. All ready, Skipper? It was 
a beautiful ship, the Sea Witch, all new and shiny, clean and fresh like a racehorse. We loaded to the Plimsoll line with trucks and tanks, ammunition, and carloads of food. The crew was new, but I was thankful for a few familiar faces. O'Hara and Abrams, Pulaski, Whitey, Doggy. And the Navy came aboard, too. Ensign Wright and ten men for a gun crew. Kids. <laughs> so young. They were quite a joke to men like O'Hara and Pulaski. Will you get a load of this? Look! Babies. Ain't you children got the wrong ship? This ain't no Hudson River Dayline. I down, Sinbad. We're here to protect you guys. They're here to protect us. Now, ain't that sweet? Get out of the way, sailor, and let us through. Now, do not be impetuous. Hey, you, uh, what's that star on your chest? That means you got high marks in music appreciation, huh, kid? Tell them, Mousy. Tell the wise guys where you got that star. I used to be on the Lex. That means the Lexington, wise guy. The Lexington? Are you kidding? Did you knock off any of them Japs, kid? Yeah, we got a few. All right, break it up, boys. Break it up. Oh, Harris. Uh, yes, sir. You and Abe will take these Navy men aft. Jones is their quarters. I'll be in the old man's office. We're sailing in two hours. Take them kind of young these days, mister. The gun crew, yeah. At least they've been trained. I sure hope so. Just between you and me, Skipper. I don't think our boys could hit the deck with their hats. Well, by the way, there's another cadet aboard. That fills our crew. Where is he? On deck. Want to see him? Might as well. What's he like? Oh, he looks pretty good to me. In torpedoes. Spent some time on a raft, and he's raring to go again. Send him in. Okay, son. The captain will see you. Thanks. Parker. Well, uh, glad to see you again. Thank you, sir. Get into your working clothes. Plenty for you to do. I'll see you later at the bridge. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. (laughs) Well, Parker again. Book learning sailors instead of experience. Well, I must admit he did all right. Times change, Skipper. Men and ships with it. Now you should have your own ship, Joe. You raided a master's license long ago. Oh, not me, Skipper. Too much worry and paperwork. <laughs> you got a wife now to think about. Well, I just got her orders. We're going to Canada. Canada? That's just between you and me. We take on more deck cargo and join a convoy. Well, if we put anything more on this ship, we'll have to put wheels on her, bottom, and push her in. Well, line the men up on deck. I'd like to meet them. Yes, sir. Later that week, as we dropped anchor off the Canadian port, a sight met our eyes that we'll never forget. There in the bay were more than 70 ships. Ships from all over the world. Holland, Greece, Russia, England, and a dozen other countries. Here in one great convoy were all the United Nations. And dashing up and down like sheepdogs tenting a flock was the British and Canadian naval escort. I went ashore that afternoon. Admiral Hartley, the convoy commander, had called a meeting of the ship's masters. All right, now, gentlemen. You've all been given a slip of paper on which has been written the number of your ship. Immediately upon weighing anchor... Each ship will display her number by a hoist of flags of the International Coast. You'll proceed to the point of rendezvous and assume your positions in the convoy as uh, shown on this diagram here. You now know the number of your own ship. And from this diagram, you'll readily learn the number of the ships immediately around you. Now, let's take a number at random here. Uh, 28. That's mine, sir. All right, Captain. By looking at this diagram, you'll see that the numbers of the ships, the beam of you, must be 27 and uh, 29. And the stern of you, numbers 18 and 34. Is that clear to you, gentlemen? Right, sir. Right, sir. Now, my ship will be the command ship. Watch me at all times for signals. Do we use only flags for communication? We'll use five methods of communication. Blinker light, rocket, whistle, flags, and loudspeaker. But absolute radio silence must be maintained. And, of course, complete blackout at night. Your normal stations will be 500 yards apart. Admiral Harker. Yes? Should we lose contact with each other, or if we're forced to scatter, how do we regain position? By proceeding to a new rendezvous at a time and place indicated in your sealed order. Now, gentlemen, I don't have to emphasize the hazards this convoy is likely to encounter. Most of us now are strangers. We'll know each other better after this voyage. Good luck. Godspeed. Mr. Rossi. Go ahead. 
ahead, Parker. Signal pennant from convoy commander. Start reading. Pennant four. William. Jake. Easy. Acknowledge. O'Hara. Yes, sir. On the searchlight. Yes, sir. Acknowledge. Convoy commander from 51. Signal. William. Jig. Easy. Aye, aye, sir. William. Jig. Easy. Keep your eyes open, Parker. I'll be up at the bridge. Yes, sir. Well, school's in, Captain. Looks like we're all present. I want all the company I can have on this voyage. You've opened the orders? That's right. Where are we headed? Russia, mister. Fort of Murmansk. Murmansk, huh? Well, I see what you mean. The orders are on my desk. When you get a chance, read them. Me? Anything can happen, mister. You might find yourself with a command, whether you want one or not. Nervous, mister? Yeah. That's okay. So am I. Come in, Mr. Rossi. Well, uh, how's it going, Parker? Skipper want me, sir? No. No, I'm just killing time. I thought you'd be asleep. I was trying to, but I couldn't make it. I've been reading. Oh, these nights are dilly, ain't they? Well, maybe we'll get used to it. We've only been out four days. I try to sleep, but every time the engine slow down, my heart speaks up. I don't have nerves like you, Mr. Rossi. Let me tell you something about my iron nerve, kid. It's made of rubber, just like everybody else's. So it'll stretch when I need it. People got a funny idea that being brave ain't being scared. But I figure that if you ain't scared, then there's nothing to be brave about. The trick is how much caring can you take. I got an idea you can take plenty. Uh, I hope so. Oh, uh, that your girl's picture? Yes, sir. Mm, nice looking. How'd she feel about you going to sea? Well, she didn't feel very good. Hmm, same as my wife. Here. Here's a picture. That's what she looks like. Oh. Say, she looks swell. Yeah. Well, we didn't have time to have a real good picture taken, you know. It's, it's kind of nice to have somebody at home thinking about you, ain't it? Yeah. Look, uh, how'd you ever happen to join the Merchant Marine, kid? I've been wanting to go to sea since I was a kid. Right now, well, it sounds pretty corny, I guess, but right now it seems to me this is the toughest, most important job anybody can do. There's none bigger than this. Gee, Mr. Rossi. When you get your own ship, I... I sure hope I get a chance to sail with you. <laughs> oh, I'm too easy going to make a skipper. Well, you go on watch soon. Better get some sleep before you... What's that? Shut up and get to your station. Sound general alarm and stand by! Captain the engine room. All engines ahead. Flank speed. Convoy commander, sir. Disperse, disperse. McNally. Acknowledge, disperse. Aye, aye, sir. Probes, mister. A dozen of them. Who's they get? One of the Greeks near as I can tell. Who's they get another? Convoy commander to squadron four, hold six. Search and attack. Search and attack. Submarines attacking on starboard quarter of convoy. Search and attack. There's your disposal rocket. Okay, mister. Take the wheel. Emergency course zigzag. Submarine on port now. Fourteen hundred. They're all around us, mister. Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille returns with George Raft, Raymond Massey, and Julie Bishop for Act Three of Action in the North Atlantic. Now, here's our fashion reporter, Libby Collins. What is it this time, Libby? Undercover fashions, Mr. Kennedy. To be exact, slip. Or rather, half slip. Well, I suppose half a slip is better than none. <laughs> Especially when it's worn to, under the popular new bareback style. Topless petticoats help your skirt hang well, yet don't show above a low-cut back. Then there are half and half slips to wear under suits. The bottom part is dark, so it won't show through if your skirt has an open weave. 
But the top part is white because most blouses are light colored. And speaking of blouses, the sheer peekaboo stars are back again. So there are lovely camisole top slips to wear under them. I guess that's one time when it's all right to tell a lady her slip is showing. <laughs> of course. But we have to be careful that what shows is sparkling, fresh, and dainty looking. Frayed, faded lace or torn shoulder straps would look awful under a sheer blouse. So it's more important than ever to give under things gentle care. And by that, I mean Lux care. Yes. Lux care makes a real difference in the way fabrics look and in the way they wear. Recently, a famous laboratory tested different washing methods, and here's what they found. Slips and nightgowns washed the Lux way stayed color fresh and lovely looking three times longer. It certainly pays to stick to Lux Lakes, as most of us know already, Mr. Kennedy. You're right, Libby. The tests showed that harsh wash day methods not only faded color, but often frayed shoulder straps, pulled out seams, and damaged the lace. So the moral is plain. We'll say it in music. Under things lead a long life. When they lead a Lux life. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. We'll have a chat with the captain and the first mate after the play. But now the curtain rises on Act Three of Action in the North Atlantic, starring George Raft, Raymond Massey, and Julie Bishop. Torpedo! Stand by! Stand by! Torpedo! We saw the torpedo cut the water like a shark across our bow. But the sub had no time to try again. That British destroyer bore down like a carrier on a rat. Smashed her stern and finished the job with shell fire. Our path of escape was clear now. We left the convoy in a nightmare of blood and battle and speeded northeast. Then late that afternoon, Joe Rossi asked me to come back. He handed me his binoculars, pointed out to sea. Well, what do you make of it, Skipper? It's a sub, all right. Following us. Playing tag and where is? I'm going forward, mister. I got some charts to look at and some thinking to do. If she changes course, call me at once. Aye, aye, sir. The sub clung to us like a leech. Out of gun range, but close enough to keep us in sight. Just before dusk, I called the ship's officers to my cabin. Come in, gentlemen. As you know, a submarine has been tailing us now for hours. I've been trying to figure out why she hasn't put on speed and come within torpedo range. Mr. Wright? She's keeping out of range, sir, because she doesn't want to match guns. I think she'll dog us till dark, submerge, then attack. Maybe. What's your opinion, Mr. Rogers? Well, I don't think that sub's interested in us. Well, it sounds crazy, but I think she knows we'll be trying to rejoin the convoy. Why should she sink us when we can lead her right back to the whole works? The whole convoy. That's good sense, mister. At least I figure it the same way. And I've changed course. I'm leading that sub away from the convoy. You all knew what that means. We can't rejoin. We're on our own. Is that clear? Yes, yes sir. We can't expect any help, men. Our first job is to shake off that sub. Our next is to beat our way to Murmansk and deliver the goods. With God's help, that's what we intend to do. I want every member of the crew to be informed of this. If you want me, I'll be asked. What? that you, Parker? Aye, aye, sir. Well, how's your pulse, kid? Oh, Mr. Rossi. Couldn't recognize in the dark. I'm okay, sir. I just took this forward watch. If any excitement tonight, it'll be for Matt. Yeah, not much chance of losing him, I guess. I give him about two more hours to get a beam on us. If we run, they'll follow us. If we stop, they'll spot us with a listening device. Huh? What did you say? I said if we stop, they'll spot us with a listening device. Yeah. If there's anything to listen to, Parker... Where's the old man? Chart room. Get below. Tell the chief engineer to report her right away in the chart room. I think maybe I got an idea. Say that again, mister. Well, instead of trying to run away, we stand still. It's too dark for them to see us, and if we feel any sound up tight, they won't be able to pick up anything on their listening apparatus. They'll sail right past us. Well, can you do it, chief? Black out every sound on board? Engines, pumps, generators, the whole works. I can do it, sure, but I won't be responsible for the safety of the ship. Will you be responsible if we get kissed by a torpedo? How long will it take you to secure everything? Ten minutes. Could you get up steam again in half an hour? Yes, sir. It's worth the risk. Go ahead. Aye, sir. Durasi, check the wind and estimate the drift. Pass word to the bosun. We've got to have complete silence throughout the ship. <laughs> Drifting. We only had a beautiful stinging fog. Well, 
lucky as it is. No moon. Yeah. All we got to do now is sit and wait. Hey, who is that? It's me, Pulaski. Lie down on the deck. My heart's pounding so fast it's going to bust right out of my chest. Ow! I'm sorry, Abrams, I didn't see you. Oh, I wish I was in Times Square. Why Times Square? I take this subway home. Tell McGonagall I expect full boilers in half an hour. You'll get him, Skipper. Don't worry. Keep your voice down, you crazy. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. In the full wash of morning sunlight, everything seemed wonderfully fresh and good again. Before noon, the radio man picked up a signal, but it was in German code and it meant nothing to it. The sea was clear for miles around us. Unmolested, we put... About and headed for her man. And then it came. Not from the seas, we might have expected, but from the sky. The dull drone of approaching planes. Unidentified planes off the starboard bow. Down general alarm. Anti aircraft battery strike target. Garazzi. Yes, sir. Those are Nazi planes that are out of Norway. Stop at the radio. Enemy planes. Clear the deck. Clear the deck. Commence firing. Commence firing. We're leaving the bridge, mister. We'll count it from the wheelhouse. Be careful, Skipper. Get crazy. After gun. After gun. Answer. Answer. Yes, sir. I can't raise the after gun. Get back there on the double. Yes, sir. And keep those guns fired. What are you doing there? Uh, the curse from wiped out. Let's get on this thing. Lead the target. Lead it. Okay, here we go. Here they come, kids. But keep your head down, Pulaski, and get right back. Wake up. Hey, Kippy, Parker! Parker! Stand by for bomb! Stand by for bomb! I don't even remember being hit. When I woke up, I was on the bunk. There was the smell of ether in the air, and Joe Rossi was taking off a pair of rubber gloves. My right leg was on fire. Well, how do you feel, Steve? What happened? You got in the way of a hunk of a bomb. I just took it out. What's the condition of the ship? She's still afloat. Can you keep her afloat? We got to. You're in no condition to swim. What about the men? They can wait. You better try to get some sleep. Well, it might help you to know we knocked off the planes, both of them. Looks like you got a ship of your own after all, Joe. You're the skipper from now on. Oh, well, try to take care of it for you, Steve. I'll drop in later on. Bill Parker's here in my cabin when you're through. We'll send them back to his folks in Kansas. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, what's this, Pulaski? It's a, it's a letter to his girl, I guess. He never finished writing it. I didn't mean to, Mr. Rossi, but I read it. That's okay. He wrote about being scared. But he said it was okay because he had confidence in us, us guys and the crew. I used to write them all the time. It made a good officer. Uh, these books, he was always studying them. Well, you got to learn it one way or another. Suppose I could borrow a couple of them books. Why, I don't think he'd mind, Pulaski. Thanks. Well, have 
having a burial service for Parker and the rest of the men at 3 o'clock. Pass the word. Yes, sir. Feeling better, Steve? A little. Joe, I got to know just how we stand. Well, we're getting patched up. Propeller shaft out of line. Midship plates are none too good, and the cargo's all over the hold. They'll be back, Joe. Planes or subs, or both. I know. The anti-aircraft guns are okay. Forward gun is knocked out. You could come about. Maybe reach Scotland and pick up another convoy. Yeah, I guess I could. But we're holding the course, Skipper. We're going to Mamad. Thanks. Well, uh, i better go out on deck now. Burial service. I wish I could go for you. Maybe you could mark the parts I should read. The Bible, Joe. Hand it to me. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. We brought nothing into the world, and it's certain we carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, that's the word of God, and it's good. These nine men here on the deck were just like us. Guys we ate with and slept with and fought with. Well, I'm sorry that folks ain't all here to see we're doing the best we can for them. I know they feel better about it. Sorry they had to die. They'll never have a chance now to finish the things they once set out to do. If those are the breaks, any of us could be lying here tomorrow and somebody read the book over us and we're tossed into the sea. And that ain't what's important. A lot more people are going to die before this is over, and it's up to the one that comes through to make sure that they didn't die for nothing. I'd like now if you all say the Lord's Prayer with our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give up. The sea witch was a crippled ship, and I was a crippled captain. But Joe kept us afloat, and we dragged along at six knots. They found us again the next morning at daybreak, another sub. It was so easy for them. How much more could we take? How much more? Torpedo, sir. There's a hole forward. You could drive a tank through. Break out all the gasoline and all you've got. Spread it amidships and set fire to it. Yes, sir. Reach to engine room. What's the damage down there? They can roll out fast, but I think we can keep under control. Cut down the two knots and send the party forward. Secure all boats. Aye, aye, sir. Mr. Rice. Yes, sir. Turn your gun starboard. The load off fires. That sub comes up. Yes, sir. Pick up those fire buckets, you guys. Pull out the sand and fill them with gasoline. Are you nuts? That's orders. Flood the forward deck and set fire. Do what I tell you. He's trying to bring that sub to the surface. Whitey, Jack, Baranka, get on those fire hoses and chemicals. Stand by till we need them. Get to the engine room, Max. Go ahead. Look. Let the oil into the fire boilers. I want a smoke screen. Open up five and seven oil valves. can't let it burn much more, sir. Fire's starting to spread. Start those chemicals, then. But keep the fire going amidships. Yes, sir. There she is. Support. Stop it surfacing. Right on. Hard right. Hard right. Hard right, sir. Reach to engine room. Give it all you've got, Mac. All you've got. Stations, men. Stand by the ram. Stand by the ram. Hang on, Whitey. Steady as you go. Steady as you go, sir. Signaling, sir. What do they want? Surrender. They'll blow us out of the water. Tell them we'll be right over Mr. Rossi, what's hit it? Oh, relax, Skipper, and lie down. Why doesn't anybody report to me? Steve, remember when they got that old tanker and the Nazis rammed our lifeboat? You swore you'd hunt them down and slice them like a piece of cheese. Well, you can consider them sliced. Thanks, mister. Thanks. told you you could get dressed. If it weren't for Abrams and Pulaski, I wouldn't know anything that was going on. They've taken me to the bridge when we get into my man. Oh, well, no, they ain't. I am. And right now, Skipper. Joe, we're there? That's right, Steve. The whole convoy's in the harbor. Looks like we're pulling up the rear. Not exactly the place of honor. Oh, I don't know. They sent out a squadron of planes to show us in. They did, huh? <laughs> That's fine, mister. That's fine. Well, come on. Let's go. Ship, 
Skipper. To you and your ship and your men. Alive and dead. There's the flagship of the convoy. They're running up some signal pennants. What's it say, Joe? Oh, I never was much on reading, Skipper. You on Hatchet. Jarvis, S.S. Seawitch. Thanks to you and crew for miracle of American seamanship. Hartridge, commander. <laughs> we'll have something to write home, mister. Will you look at that on the dock? Same. Heaving rope. Same. Throw off that pater, Pulaski. Hey, Abrams, what's that mean? Savar, Richie. That means comrade. That's good. Hey, will you get a load of that? Yeah, Tavo Ritchie yourself, cutie. Hey, what are you doing tonight? Hey, fast! Hey, fast! Oh, that's the first time I ever wanted to kiss a longshoreman. They're waving at us, Joe. Come on, wave back. Hey, mister, what's wrong with you? Too big? Something like that, yeah. I was just thinking. Thinking of the trip back home. <laughs> That's the end of the story. But it's not really the end. The story of the merchant marine will go on and on until some dawn the sun will lift over the horizon and look down upon calm waters and the anguish of the seas will be no more. And all the world will rise to a new day of peace. Ships of the Merchant Marine are ready now, ladies and gentlemen. They're in the water, waiting for crews. Are there any experienced seamen listening to me now? There's a berth in one of those ships for you. Just telegraph to Merchant Marine, Washington, D.C. Telegraph, collect. I'll repeat the address. Please wire, collect to Merchant Marine, Washington, D.C. America needs your help. Before our stars return for their curtain calls, here's Sally saying it's time to do a little wool gathering. I understand that in the spring, a young moth's fancy turns to... Food, Mr. Kennedy. And how moths love to feed on a nice woolen sweater or dress or your softest, prettiest blanket, especially if they're soiled. You're leading right up to Lux Flakes, aren't you, Sally? Yes. All washable woolens should be luxed before they're put away for the summer. Clean things aren't nearly so tempting to moths. Just make rich, lukewarm Lux suds and rinse in water at the same temperature. You can be sure that gentle Lux care will keep wool from shrinking or fading. And here's the point about packing blankets and woolens away. Be sure the paper package is tightly closed. Roll the edges or seal them with gummed tape. And don't forget that little place at the top where the hanger comes out of a garment bag. Now, of course, there'll be some of your woolens you'll keep on wearing. Lightweight sweaters, for example. Lux them often. They'll stay new looking longer. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our star. The convoy has made port, and George Raft, Raymond Massey, and Julie Bishop are sailing a straight course back to the footlights. By the way, George, they tell me you haven't been seen at the ballpark much this year. You haven't gone back on baseball, have you? No, sir, CB. I was overseas for a while with a USO unit. But I'll be out there soon. Seems to me, George, that a fellow who loves baseball as much as you do should be playing it. From what I read in the papers, they need him. <laughs> <laughs> That's rather a sore point, Ray. You see, George was a ball player once. Let's see, where where was that? I played left field for Springfield, Massachusetts, in the Eastern League. <laughs> so why keep it a secret? Were you good? No, I couldn't hit. But if you can walk, you'll probably get a call from half a dozen teams in the morning. <laughs> So because of a bad batting average, you're starring in pictures instead of baseball. Well, that isn't how you got into the acting business, is it, Ray? Well, no, C.B. I was over in Siberia with the Canadian Army after the last war, and I ran into some American vaudevillians. We put on a minstrel show to forget the cold weather, so here I am. <laughs> well, obviously, you were the ball player or in the Canadian Army, Julie. What put you in pictures besides a lot of beauty and talent? I know how to ride a horse. Oh. So did Paul Revere. <laughs> well, I started in Western pictures, and for a couple of years I couldn't act unless I was sitting in a saddle. But speaking of acting, what's your play going to be next week, Mr. DeMille? A delightful musical comedy, Julie. It's the 20th Century Fox hit, 
springtime in the Rockies. And our stars will be Betty Grable, Dick Powell, and Carmen Miranda. <laughs> the story begins on Broadway with two dancing partners starring in a musical team. It finishes in the Canadian Rockies. And in between, there's all the music and romance that makes springtime in the Rockies great entertainment for springtime anywhere. That sounds like a surefire hit, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good sailing to all of you. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Betty Grable, Dick Powell, and Carmen Miranda in Springtime in the Rockies. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. On Friday night, Cecil B. DeMille's talent as the great judge of beauty will be called to service on the Amos and Andy Show. Don't miss this hilarious program. Your local paper will tell you the time and station. The night is next Friday, May 19th, on the Amos and Andy program. George Raft's new picture is the universal production, Follow the Boys. Raymond Massey is currently making the picture, The Woman in the Window, for international pictures. Heard in tonight's play were Bill Martell, Leo Cleary, Eddie Marr, Herb Litton, Tyler McVeigh, Bob Young, Norman Field, Griff Barnett, Eddie Emerson, Stan Farrar, Regina Wallace, Cliff Clark, Charles Steele, Ralph Lewis, and John McIntyre. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our music was directed by Louis Silver. Three bells for three great shows. Same time, same station. Listen tomorrow night at lunch time for George Burns and Gracie Allen and their guest star, So-and-So. Listen Wednesday night for Frank Sinatra singing the late hit, So-and-So. So-and-so will be Frank's guest. This time, lunch time, every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for the tops in entertainment. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Betty Grable, Dick Powell, and Carmen Miranda in Springtime in the Rockies.